Anyway, I'm, I'm Michael Pelius. I'll be chairing this. Uh, to my left is uh, Kristen Lawler, Bruno Gulli, uh, Peter Bratzis, and Carlos Frade, who will all be giving a talk sort of in this order. Bruno will take these two. Um, Kristen will um, be uh, talking about number three, Peter Bratzis here, uh, on extended reproduction and why Elk is there now. And Carlos will try to frame the thought of Elk is there around continuity and discontinuity. And, and again, the, the question why we read them today. Um, this book has many new essays, and my interest uh, really is, Althusser posed the question, is it simple to be a Marxist in philosophy? And it's not, <laughs> obviously not, to be, uh, be a, a, a simple thing to be a Marxist in philosophy. Uh, first of all, I think we're still in the embryonic stages of developing uh, a Marxist materialism or a materialist <coughs> conceptions of philosophy. There have been, I'd say, probably three uh, uh, major attempts. Uh, one, of course, by Althusser in terms of his um, essay, Is It Simple to Be a Marxist in Philosophy? And all, in the beginning of this book, very interesting the way he reads the history of philosophy called What is Philosophy? And I really recommend that for those of you working in philosophy mm -hmm. to read and, and look at uh, uh, in a very, in a very significant way. Althusser never really gave up philosophy and moved, moved into either sociology or to other disciplines. Um, he stayed very much within the tradition. I certainly know he's educated as a Cartesian. He broke with that. Um, he uh, wrote his um, early, uh, I think his, his first dissertation was on Hegel on specters of Hegel, even though he dropped Hegel, as probably most people in the audience know, uh, later on. And uh, then began, I think, a, a very serious uh, uh, reading after uh, of, of Marx, which was part of this epistemological break, where there was a, a leap in Marx's thought um, where he locates this in the German ideology, that it's a radical break from the pattern of previous philosophy, and that what Marx really orients us towards is a new philosophical conception of history. And Althusser is the first to do this as, quote, um, you know, as a mo moment of a radical break. He had a continuous pattern, I think, in both Lukács and Gramsci, the other two people, you know, who I would consider the main significant philosopher, Marxist philosophers of the 20th century. So anyway, I recommend that you uh, uh, read this first essay. And also, um, and I'll, I'll go back to this because Bruno uh, Dooley, who will follow uh, me after I do just a little more of an introduction, will raise the question of humanistic Marxism or the humanist tradition and the anti-humanist tradition, of which Althusser is the main representative, at least in the Marxist tradition, post, uh, post Heidegger. And, uh, and maybe even in Bachelard, you'll have some of that notion in the French uh, tradition that we're in the state's been very unaware of what an epistemological break really means as a pretty scientific moment. Um, anyway, I think maybe the best thing to do is start with, with, with the, the talks, and I'll try to you know bring it together at the end, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Do you want to? Hey, as Michael said, uh, I will uh, be addressing these two questions, right? And I start with uh, the repressive uh, and uh, state apparatus versus the and the ideological state apparatus. <coughs> but really what I want to do is uh, then uh, maybe I can even uh, read from uh, uh, to Sir uh, with some quotes, by right, some relevant quotes, but what I want to do is ask the question as to whether, you know, uh, Althusser's distinction between the two apparatuses uh, still works today. I mean, of course, Althusser never said that it's either one. There is always the question of what's in the ideological state of practice. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they always work together. There is, uh, of course, ideology in uh, the repressive state apparatus. I mean, just, just for uh, the question of uh, clarity at the beginning, uh, the difference is that, uh, of course, the ideological state apparatuses are uh, right, responsible for uh, the reproduction of uh, the uh, relations for production. And uh, the repressive state apparatus is there to ensure the political conditions. Right, so I mean, it is, of course, uh, it's a more basic uh, situation, like the police, uh, the, the judiciary, and so on. 
I, I, you know, I, I was uh, rereading this yesterday. I thought it may be one of the best uh, moments to or also one of the best places to understand the problematic nature, especially today, of uh, the relationship between uh, the ideological state apparatuses like the family, the school, and the church, the school, and so on. Uh, and uh, the repressive state apparatus is to look at a footnote in uh, in uh, uh, the essay ideology and the ideological state apparatus is uh, if it goes to, if you get the book footnote nine page two forty three where he says the law belongs both uh, to the repressive state apparatus and uh, to the system of uh, ISAs which is the ideological state apparatus the law. The law, I, I think that this is really the problem today, and so I start more than any other thing, you know, more than I could also give a cursory, uh, you know, a schematic account of uh, Althusser's uh, essay here, but I, I want immediately to ask the question, problematize this, you know, what is the place of the law today really as this in-between, the repressive apparatus on the one hand, the ideological state apparatus is on the other. You know, I, I think that this is really the question because uh, what really prompts the question for me is uh, the uh, belief that I believe uh, everybody shares that uh, we are uh, increasingly living in uh, a police state in uh, the cities, the, the American cities, uh, the U.S., uh, you know, nationwide and globally, right? I mean, uh, we can also, I, I can also mention that the concept of uh, uh, the, the sovereign police, uh, the Tagamben, uh, for example, the Tagamben speaks of uh, so I mean, the question is uh, why. On the one hand, uh, I, I realize that I always ask this question also when I teach to my students, right? Uh, do you think that it is uh, that there is a more police brutality today or military brutality and so on, or uh, is it only because of social networking? Because you know, of, uh, as uh, Michael Moore once said, everybody is a filmmaker today, so we have videos that prove what uh, in the past maybe was not uh, women. Or uh, is it that indeed there is more? Uh, of uh, this uh, repression uh, from uh, the state. And I believe that there is. I mean, I don't think it's only more information that we have, uh, because, uh, you know, this uh, repression, this, uh, therefore, what then becomes brutality, you know, system, systemic and systematic brutality, like the Stubborn Priest Law in, in New York City or other similar situations, right? I mean, uh, but this is uh, already there, already present with the presence that, of the police. I mean, it doesn't have to be simply, you know, a situation that escalates and becomes a clear case of police brutality, but it is there with this uh, uh, right, constant uh, uh, and uh, uh, threatening uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, arrogant uh, presence, which is, which is uh, you know, something that should make us think as to why this is happening more and more. So I think that the law the law, as uh, Arthur says, the law is this in between, right? This, this uh, uh, situation, this uh, you know, that belongs both to the repressive state apparatus and uh, the ideological state apparatus is very important, right? So I mean, uh, it would be interesting to understand also what uh, the law is, uh, and of course, I mean. I, I won't speak more than 10 minutes, but we can only think about, of course, Walter Benjamin, who clearly says the law has uh, bloody uh, roots, right? I mean, it comes from violence, whatever we understand that the, certainly the law is command, uh, right? The law that comes from, uh, at least uh, in modernity, the tradition coming from Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, right? The law understood as sovereignty, and therefore as command. Uh, is uh, uh, grounded in, uh, in uh, violence, and uh, it remains uh, a violent, systemically so, throughout, uh, right? So actually there is in this book, right, in the new book of Althusser, there is uh, also an interesting essay, I just called attention to it, which is called Remarks, uh, Further Remarks on Law, you know, uh, this, uh, this essay uh, on the law theory, where he says that uh, uh, on page 169, uh, in the middle of the page, uh, he says that uh, the law, uh, it, uh, the law it is the ideological state apparatus that, uh, and I speak some words, that directly, is there directly to ensure the functionist 
the function, sorry, the functioning of <coughs> capitalist relation to production. Right? So, I mean, the book has really this fundamental uh, role to play, you know, on the one hand, in between uh, the repressive state apparatus and uh, as part of uh, almost the, the, the soul, the soul, I would say, of uh, the repressive state apparatus. And on the other, it is also one of uh, the uh, ideological state apparatus. So I want, just want to call attention to this. So ask the question, you know, I could bring more from, uh, uh, from uh, but I, I want to ask also the, the second question. I read more from Althusser, maybe we'll have uh, a chance then to look at other uh, relevant passages. But the question of uh, the law understood this way really uh, makes us uh, perhaps rethink the role of uh, the repressive state apparatus versus the ideological state apparatuses and uh, per perhaps understand that today the, the repressive state apparatus is a uh, dominant. I mean, Althusser says that uh, you know, among the ideological state apparatuses in our own times it is education. The school actually is a family school couple that replaces the, the church, uh, you know, the family church couple of uh, uh, an earlier time. But education too, I mean, uh, and, and this can be seen in many uh, in many ways, I mean, from uh, the militarization of uh, schools uh, and colleges, right, councils, and uh, the, the bureaucracy also that is part of uh, the broader concept of the police. I mean, it's not the police as such, you know, but uh, that uh, lets us see really that perhaps there is this uh, this uh, dominance today of uh, the repressive state apparatus vis-a-vis -vis the ideological state apparatus. So I don't know if this is clear, but what I, you know, then have the implications, we will talk about that, but some of them, the, there may be many implications to draw from this. One is that perhaps uh, there is a crisis uh, or that ideology uh, is uh, uh, weakened, certainly that there is a crisis of ideology uh, as I would also say, that there is a crisis of a hegemony. I would look at ideology and hegemony in a similar way, and uh, I think that that was very loud for that. And uh, that there is a crisis of war. And uh, because of this crisis of a hegemony, which also entails you know, a cultural uh, ability, power of a persuasion uh, and uh, of a ideology, then uh, all that remains uh, to, to power to the state is to perform these actions of a brutal domination of a going back to what the law essentially is, which is violence. So that, that's what I, I, this is one of the questions that I wanted to raise. The other one has to do with uh, humanism, anti-humanism, as um, Michael said, uh, Arthur said is the really, uh, the, the, the philosopher of the anti-humanist tradition in, uh, the, the, within uh, Marxism and for sure. I get to say I asked the question because I never understood really this concept of a theoretical or philosophical anti-humanism. I mean, it's not only a question of the world that, you know, we can change the world. And, I mean, I understand that it is theoretical, philosophical, not uh, uh, practical, but still I have uh, problems with the idea of uh, you know, I don't think that it is uh, um, uh, productive uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, anything, but uh, only perhaps, uh, but I'm, I'm saying this too simplistically, but perhaps confusing the issue. I mean, it, there is, in, in this book at least, there is the, uh, the important uh, um, essay by Althusser called Marxism and uh, Humanism, where he explains, of course, that uh, it is a theoretical, philosophical anti-humanism. The key is uh, going back to the what Michael would put on the epistemological break, uh, that uh, it's, it's a concept of uh, Gaston Bachelard, but then, uh, you know, this break that Althusser detects in Marx uh, around the year 1845, right? So the, the, the division, the rupture between the early Marx on the one hand and then what comes later in Marx. So, for example, the difference between uh, something like the economic and, and uh, philosophical manuscripts of 1844 and, uh, you know, the Grundrisse, uh, later or uh, even Capital. Again, I wouldn't have the time to, uh, you know, develop this. I just want to ask the question, maybe we had a discussion. I see that as a problem. I don't see this rupture in Marx. 
uh, in the way in which, for example, Althusser in the school, uh, coming from Althusser, uh, claims, uh, claim, right? Uh, but again, uh, it, it is uh, uh, a matter of debate, but I think it's important to understand. Also, it is important, I believe, to ask this question today, why not, not for the sake of doing uh, simply uh, scholarly uh, uh, things, uh, it, but, but also because I think that perhaps the concept of a humanism must be recuperated. I mean, I, I really think that uh, it is a, a wrong approach uh, that uh, very often the left has to uh, take so much distance from uh, these concepts for fear of falling into a discourse of uh, human rights, humanitarianism, and so on and so forth. I think that uh, distinctions must be made. Uh, philosophy is there to make distinctions, but humanism belongs in the type of discourse that we want to draw. I mean, I just, in closing, I want to say that just yesterday I finished uh, a manuscript that I'm emailing today that is called Humanism, uh, no, no, sorry, Humanity and uh, the Enemy. And uh, so, I mean, I also, when, when I say this few, you know, scattered, scattered remarks, I'm also thinking about the work that I have been doing. But probably I should start here. I don't know if I yes, we can go back. Yeah, more, we're gonna, but, uh, I, I hope I gave a broad. Okay, okay, yeah, okay yeah, yeah. so. For a problematic place, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. you want to stand or okay. lay out what I see as a couple of the major problematics that are sort of in out um, there. And my first sort of uh, question, the first place where my attention goes is, um, you know, I take the fact yeah. that uh, this uh, text has been newly translated and is getting a lot of attention, there are a number of people in this room, uh, as sort of an interesting sign of the times. Um, and what kind of sign of the times it is when people want to read Altidere and think about Altidere, I think is a big question, and that's sort of been uh, uh, debated. But I always take this kind of stuff as, as an index of things that are happening. Many of us maybe remember when the Socialist Scholars Conference was like a couple hundred people and it wasn't very big, you know, ha, ah, like this is a sign of the times, the massive massiveness uh, of the left forum. The fact that this uh, uh, publisher is gonna start uh, charging for the works of Marx, you know, that's an interesting sign of the times. Somebody's like, hey, people are interested in Marx, maybe I'll get money from this. Um, uh, Piketty is a rock star. You know, like I think there's a lot of stuff that really indicate um, a, a sort of a fascinating and a, a leftist time at the moment, and a very Marxist time. I mean, when I started reading Marx, it was, there were a lot of people who, you know, sort of thought it was like quaint and cute, and now I have students who come to me like, I heard you're a Marxist, can we talk about that? I think that's like really cool. Um, so, so I think that this is partly a sign of uh, a sort of Marxist time, right? Um, you know, Frontier in 1974 said he thought of that an uh, interest in Altidere was a sign of defeat. That it really is a, uh, it's a theory of when we're most screwed over, when the world looks most like the matrix and the real is somewhere way back there and we're all totally ensnared in this, right? Interpolated like crazy. Um, and I see it as something a little bit different. I, I see it as uh, we live in a sort of a Marxist time. Um, you know, it, people can talk about whether this is a moment of defeat or a moment of uh, excitement or um, victory, maybe not victory, certainly, but are, are we in sort of a very interesting wave of protest or has that been kind of beaten down? What's going on? What I think is mostly, um, you know, what this is all about is that there are certain fundamental issues in Marxism that people realize we have to really look at and we have to really think about. The first one, as Bruno really laid out very well, and so I won't you know, talk too much about that, is, um, or really at all, uh, sorry, I keep saying like, do you want to join this network? No, then you look. Is the status of reproduction, right? Is it ideological? Is reproduction really happening in the schools? Or are our kids like, really mostly being drugged out of their resistance is, you know, are what, do we just see tear gas and drones everywhere or is ideological reproduction really still how the system keeps going? And I think Bruno framed that question beautifully and that that's something, you know, that we should really 
discuss. Hang on, I'm just gonna take a look. <laughs> okay, uh, the other thing is the status of science, right? And the uh, status of a, a scientific kind of a Marxism. Um, I think that obviously uh, the status of Marxism as a, a critique of ideology, which is the basic idea of Altidere about what science is. It sort of corrects ideology. It's a critique of ideology. That's basic to Marxism and I think uh, incredibly important. But I think that um, this sort of, I do think that Althusser makes a fetish of science in a way that feels creaky and old fashioned, I think, when we read it in a lot of ways. Um, and that I think is related to some of the real problems in terms of thinking about form and content and structure and agency that I think, you know, that sort of uh, ideology versus struggle, domination versus, you know, struggle as a motor of social change, struggle from the bottom. I think his, um, his idea of uh, uh, science as sort of the way not to get to the real, he never said, we never get to the real, it never happens. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, all his really revolutionary anti-humanism notwithstanding, because he really founded the decentering of the subject in theory, and more importantly in Marxism, he's the theorist of our alienation. The idea that he so vociferously disavowed as authentic in Marx. Alienation. The new text shows how he wants to say class struggle over and over, right? When you read this whole thing, he, he says it much more than he does in the original ideology essay, over and over. And everything's about class struggle. This is all about transformation. Um, but his theory is really just the theory of the ways we're alienated from the real. Um, and I think that's important. It's a key lens you know, to use to look at uh, the world and capitalism, but it's not all of it. And this theoretical focus, no matter how much he says the opposite, is where his attention is. Um, he he talked about class struggle over and over, but the moments of recognition, the moments where when you're reading Althusser, it really comes alive, where his focus is are all the ways in which, you know, when the cop is hailing the guy in the street, or even in this new one, there's a moment where he says, you know how you're recognizing what I'm saying, and I'm recognizing what I'm saying? That's ideology, none of that's real. You're, you're, we're all ensnared completely. Um, uh, and I think this has to do with the fetish around science as method because only a totally alienated object can be examined scientifically. Um, and I think it's key here that the text is really fragmented um, and that it keeps talking about this, um, the next volume that's going to come out that's going to be on class struggle. I always think that's sort of symptomatic. Where he says, like, I am going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it. And he keeps saying it, but the moments that he brings to life are not the moments of proletarian class struggle from below. And I think that's really important. Um, and so this is obviously related to the big question in Althusser, in Marxism, in capitalism, which is really just the old structure and the agency question. This is really, um, I think, the central uh, problematic. And he's Clear. History is a process without a subject. Uh, there's no agency, really. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that people started blowing off Althusser for a long time was in the future last forever when he describes killing his wife. It's insane. I mean, it's completely insane. There's two paragraphs where he, he describes this situation and there's no actor. Like, he's literally murdering his wife and he's the way that, I don't have a quote from it right now, but the way that he talks about it is as though something was acting through him and something else was happening and it wasn't him doing it. So I think that there are some real, um, you know, there are some real problems with seeing the world this way and with uh, uh, sort of, you know, it, the, I think the deconstruction of the subject, the anti-humanism, is actually incredibly important and became really important in Marxism, in French theory, in, and I, don't, I think we can't unthink that thought. You know, we can't unring that bell, and that's really, really um, important, but you can't take it too far. Literally, <laughs> you know, you can really take it too far. Um, now, I think that, um, you know, this has to do with the, uh, ultimately the strategic position that he comes out with, right? That really all you can sort of do is, is socialize new subjectivities out of uh, uh, other kinds of ISAs that, that generate proletarian subjectivities. Um, 
so, uh, you know, I think that that's something we should think about. Is that the only strategic possibility, right? The party uh, struggling the ISAs, generating proletarian subjectivities, taking over the ISAs, then to, to uh, abolish them and ultimately abolish the state. Um, but I think that, um, you know, this is very much a, a sort of a capital logic way of thinking about things. And I always, in reading the ISA essay, was most excited by the moments, like in the very beginning, where he talks about the reproduction of the forces of production. And he talks about the wage, and that the wage is the fundamental way that the, you know, that the worker is reproduced. And when he talks about what constitutes the wage, he says, he quotes Marx and says, uh, you know, it's not just a biological minimum. English workers, beer is part of it. French workers, wine is part of it. You know, that this is something that even at the most basic level of reproduction, he begins the essay with this and then kind of blows it up and says, no, it's the reproduction of the relations of production that's really most important. Um, I, I always thought that that was sort of important, that he, he brought that up as so central, this idea of pleasure and struggle and things that aren't about work being the sort of locus of this very basic way of reproduction, which is the wage, um, and then just sort of moving on from it. And the reason that he does that is because, and this is the stuff that I really found, although I don't think there's necessarily anything like revolutionary in this new text, like, oh my god, I had no idea, I'll just already thought that. Um, but uh, there are some moments in terms of thinking about structure and agency, in terms of thinking especially about form and content, that I think are, he's much more explicit um, than uh, uh, certainly in the ISIS and, and in, other, um, in other places. He's very clear that class struggle is motored by bourgeois class struggle, that capital acts and the working class reacts. And I think that that's the central sort of issue here, and that's the central you know, piece in thinking about how capitalism works and how proletarian you know, class struggle uh, works. I think that this is uh, part of where this idea that Althusser is like so theoretical and just sort of has his head in the clouds and isn't practical, you know, kind of comes from. Um, but I think it's it's less about theory um, and more about capital logic. This this way of understanding capitalism as being purely really driven um, by capital. And he says. Um, he says it very, very clearly. The boss is the one who acts and the people are acted on. Um, so strategically, uh, in order for there to be real action, the proletariat has to become the boss first, and then we'll have the power to abolish Boston. Uh, so a new proletarian party ideology is the only answer. Um, and he's got a quote, it's on page 230 of this new um, translation. He says, we have a mistaken notion of class struggle if we suppose that it results from the working class as revolt against social injustice, inequality, or even capitalist exploitation. In a word, if we reduce class struggle to the working class's struggle against given conditions of exploitation and the bourgeois class's response to that struggle, this would be to forget that the conditions of exploitation have primacy that the process of creating the conditions for exploiting workers is the fundamental form of bourgeois class struggle, that consequently exploitation is already class struggle, and thus that the bourgeois class struggle has primacy. The whole history of primitive accumulation can be considered the production of the working class by the bourgeois class in a process of class struggle that creates the conditions for capitalist exploitation. So, um, so this is again where his strategic uh, sort of ideas come from, right? If you think that, there's only sort of one kind of politics, all you can do is kind of get up there. It's, there's very little about the ability of transformation from below, although he says it and says it over and over again, he doesn't bring it to light, I don't think. Um, and I think that this has a lot to do uh, with his take on form versus content. And he does this sort of interesting thing where, this is on page 207, um, he dismisses the thermodynamic physics that he says limited Freud because he had to use those terms. He says every theorist has to deal with the science and the scientific metaphors that are around them. Um, and that Freud had thermodynamics, uh, uh, but um, he says now the science of linguistics has allowed Lacan to really understand Freud in new, more accurate terms. And for him, more accurate is 
much more focused on form than on content or substance. Um, and he says, where a superficial or prejudiced reading of Freud has only seen happy, lawless childhood, the paradise of polymorphous perversity, a kind of state of nature only punctuated by stages of a biological type linked with the functional primacy, sorry, Uh, linked with the functional primacy of some part of the human body, the site of a vital need, Lacan demonstrates the effectiveness of the order, the law, that has been lying in wait for each infant born since before his birth, and seizes him before his first cry, assigning to him his place and role, and hence his fixed destination. Um, and, you know, and the other thing that he says about form and content coming out of Lacan and this more French structuralist uh, linguistic reading of Freud, which I think really drives the whole uh, sort of capital logic uh, uh, analysis, a more structural, less humanist, um, agency-based um, uh, kind of analysis. Uh, he's got in a footnote here somewhere, he also says uh, that Lacan says the content of the unconscious doesn't matter. The content of unconscious desires don't matter, really. It's really about the structure of the unconscious and the form. And because of this, we're sort of always already interpolated as subjects. There are, and of course it's true, right? He says there are stories waiting for us before we're even born. Stories that, that, that make us into the subject that we're going to be. And you know, that's all very true. But I think it leads to a certain kind of analysis where the content doesn't matter as much. Think about like the Birmingham School who really sort of took this very seriously and analyzed post-war youth subcultures on the basis of it. For them, uh, you know, skinheads and punk rockers were basically structurally the same, right? A, they were rebellion that ultimately didn't really matter because they were always already folded back into the system, but also the content of what the two groups were saying didn't necessarily matter. Um, so I'm gonna, I have a couple other things here, but I think that that's the most important thing, this sort of like, Con uh, form over content, structure over agency, analysis of the unconscious, of uh, the possibility of rebellion, the possibility of struggle, um, and, and I think that takes us always in a certain direction in terms of analysis, um, but also in terms of strategy, in terms of what kind of political activity is most um, appropriate for ending capitalism, basically. Um, and so, you know, there are a number of things that, uh, there are a couple other things here, like the focus on everyday, everyday life is incredibly important. Uh, a really, uh, uh, I also there's where I learned materialism, right? <laughs> like the material, the fact that ideology and ideas are always carried in apparatuses and practices, stuff like that. Um, there are a couple moments where, you know, I think, as a fellow Catholic or raised Catholic, you know, Althusser's whole analysis of the way stand in church, you know, stand up, sit down, chant, sing, do this, move here, move. He talks about that as this to sort of total interpolation, as, a, as an example of this subjectification, but never talks about what, you know, to me, I don't know, Catholic schoolgirls are always like outside the church. What is it? Like, <laughs> the Pope is a rebel, the nuns on the bus. Like there's, you know, it doesn't, even at that level, it doesn't work the way he thinks it works. It's not as complete, it's not as elegant a sort of French structure. I sort of think uh, a different kind of a maybe more German <coughs> reading uh, of Freud and Marx, who are both obviously German theorists, gets us to something um, uh, you know, a little more fruitful anyway. Um, so I just want to read uh, one last little thing because I think that in uh, Valley Bar's introduction to this text, he's got a very interesting sort of moment about the possibility of struggle. Um, so basically I'm arguing that, uh, that the French reading of Marx and Freud is too one-sided, too structural, too capitalogic, too functionalist. Um, uh, and that postmodern theorists who came in the wake of Althusser's decentering of the subject showed that there's more politically to emerge from this than the capital logic of the work on ideology and reproduction, um, especially Negri's 1978 lectures, uh, Marx Beyond Marx, which were given at Althusser's 
invitation in which he decenters the subject. He enacts an anti-humanism, but in a different way. Um, he talks about antagonism and, and two opposing subjectivities as being precisely what constitutes uh, uh, capitalism. Um, and in fact, it's Negri's discussion of the wage as the key moment in capitalism that shows us the most politically useful part about Sears' work on ideology, the idea that the wage is an effect of working class power uh, and subjectivity. So my question is always, also I think Deleuze is sort of, Deleuze's reading of Nietzsche is sort of an important uh, way to, to understand the decentering of the subject and have it be more political in a way that's not just about, um, uh, you know, sort of taking over new uh, ISAs. Um, so here, I just want to read a little bit of uh, just one paragraph from Valdivar's introduction that I think maybe, to my mind, leads us to something sort of um, he says, Valdemar says that the key to understanding Althusser is seeing the latent controversy with Lacan over the nature of the real, and that Althusser refuses Lacan's identification of the real as the traumatic or unrepresentable, and says that Althusser, quote, implicitly asks how we should think the real, which in the well-known Lacanian scheme forms the third pillar of the explanation of the unconscious. What then constitutes the positivity of the real? I think that this is, you know, what sort of busts through all of that, right? In, in thinking psychoanalytically and in terms of uh, class struggle under capitalism. Um, what then constitutes the positivity of the real? The correlate of the materiality of the imaginary. The suggestion is made in the text horizon, but here too in very enigmatic fashion that this question can probably not be divorced from the question of the bad subject, the one who does not manage to go all by herself, or who resists interpolation. Okay. Now, uh, Peter um, Francis on uh, extended uh, reproduction. Why else is there now, again? <laughs> This, it's an unusual and unexpected, in some ways, return of Althusser that we're experiencing now, like you say, because uh, there was a moment in the late 1670s where Althusser, his school of Marxism, what would be called structural Marxism, mm -hmm. Althusserian Marxism, was a very important, prominent force in terms of academia, in terms of the left more generally, there were, of course, there were some famous journals, New Left Review, of course, most importantly, that were very much... Can you speak loud, please? Yes. Loud. New Left Review, as an example, was very much uh, in the line of uh, Althusserian uh, and Gramscian uh, Marxism uh, uh, from its break under Perry Anderson onwards in many, 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 way, many ways. And then there came a moment when it vanished. I mean, something Slavoj Žižek has termed theoretical amnesia about this peculiar decline of, of Althusserian, Althusserian Marxism. And it coincided with some tragic events in 1979, uh, Nikos Polanzas committed suicide. In 1980, Althusser killed his wife, and then, you know, that was the end of his uh, formal career, and he went into a kind of exile in the, the suburbs of Paris. And, Michel Pichu, who wrote a very, wrote probably the best book on ideology, uh, you know, uh, language, semantics, and ide ideology, um, committed suicide in Mexico, I think it was 1982. So there was the death of some of the, the key figures of, of uh, the Althusserian uh, left, or Althusserian Marxism. There was a political shift in the academy, and also, of course, more generally, so that by the 1980s, many of these books were out of print. Nothing new was coming out, that's for sure. And things were very marginal. And that's when I discovered Althusser as an undergraduate student uh, in the late 1980s, together with my comrade up there in the back of Ungupta, we were in school together in Maryland. And it was incredibly uh, powerful reading of Husserl. And it was incredibly powerful and incredibly useful, I think, for two fundamental reasons. One was the analytical rigor. There was an, uh, 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 Althusser provided you with tools for understanding the world around you. 
and growing up, it was born in Greece and grew up in Baltimore, living in East Baltimore, in the shadows of Bethlehem Steel and General Motors and industrial, then, I mean, in decline, but then still these factors existed, now they no longer exist. General Motors became a, uh, has now become an Amazon uh, warehouse. Toward the actual, the you knew some things, but you couldn't explain or understand what was going on around you. you had no, we had no idea how stupid we were. We were so stupid, we didn't know we were stupid. And then when you read out to Sarah, and fear with a capital T, as, then you begin to understand that, you know, you have been living in ideology. There are all kinds of fundamental questions we didn't even think to ask. <coughs> And for some years, I, I, was, I became a very strict Althusserian, and I read only Althusser or things around that. You, you go to the bookstores, and I would look in the back in the index. Is the book any good? You have Althusser? Right? <laughs> <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> so I think that was, that was really a, a very useful and important uh, uh, attribute of Althusser, and Althusser in particular because he had the, the, the systematic rigor. You had the, the categories, the concepts presented in a systematic way that were really useful to, to under, helping to understand things. You could have done it another way. I mean, you could have read, of course, you know, Max Weber or others, but it, I mean, it so happened that within uh, Marxism, at least, Althusser provided you with a very good uh, uh, problematic set of questions and set of categories through which to try to understand things. Another thing that was very important is with this this set of arguments in particular reproduction, because in 1988 or 1989 or so, things were extremely static and boring. Who knew that things would get much worse? I mean, who knew that the Reagan Bush years would be wonderful compared to you know what would you know come later in many ways, but it was a very boring, very the idea that nothing would ever change. So the problematic Althusser puts forth here in the famous S1 ideology, which in English came out in a collection of essays, uh, I love in philosophy and other essays, the Monthly Review Press, in 1971, was a very important set of ideas. And it was very important, number one, because it was on this question of extended reproduction. How is it that these social formations are able to reproduce themselves? And you know, we don't see then the, the end or the limits of capitalism. And it was important because it was a, this question of extended reproduction obliged one to step out of an economistic framework. It's very easy to get stuck into debates about rates of profit and the circuit of capital and you know, what is a socially necessary wage and what is social necessary labor time, and all of which are important. But for Althusser, the question has to become, has to be political, because he argues here, you cannot understand society without understanding how it produces itself. And you can't understand how something produces itself in contemporary, capi contemporary capitalist societies without understanding the question of the state of politics. Because the economic moment is insufficient towards, for the reproduction. So that was. Also, I think, something very important that how is it that the system so relatively easily is able to produce itself? How is it? And here I think I don't agree with, and Althusser has one of the new things in this version is he has a response to his critics, which is very interesting. And the main criticism had been, and still is in many ways, that the arguments are functional that Althusser presupposes some kind of omnipotent knowledge by the state on the productive needs of the system, and thus acts supporting. He says there's nothing to do with that. Here he comes very close, I think, to Karl in the Great Transformation, with the idea of the double movement. And for him, it is the class struggle and the capacity of the state to mediate these struggles and modify things that function towards the extent of the production of the system. So if you recall from Parpogliani, of course, uh, the struggles from below were very 
important for the extended reproduction of uh, the capitalist societies because it obliged the capitalist class to slow things down at a pace that was, it could be endured by the population. <clears throat> and you had this transformation to full-fledged capitalism without completely destroying the basic precon preconditions under which it could happen. You had a population that was willing to labor. You had a certain kind of uh, technical capacities and all the rest. And I think we can add to the original formulation by Althusser a couple of limitations to bring it to the more contemporary question. Because if in 1988 or 1989 or 1990, 1991, we were concerned with, well, how the hell is the system being capable of producing itself so easily? The concern now is the opposite. The concern now from Piketty, Occupy onwards is the environmental movement. Will capitalism be able to reproduce itself? Now the question is, is it capable of reproducing itself? It's the opposite in some ways. Rather than how can it manage so easily to do it now is, well, maybe no longer can do it. And this brings up a whole new set, set of questions. I think that in some ways we have to go beyond the uh, Althusser. To begin with, we have to note that the reproduction of capitalist societies are not only a product of their internal dynamics. One, we have the, the problem of, of nature. And there are some environmental or natural limits, obviously, that become more and more clear to capitalism. That there comes a point where, of course, you cannot keep reproducing things in the same ways because the natural limitations are <laughs> to it. In some ways, also, I think we have to note that labor, or the, to use a different um, language, more barbarian in some ways, or early, the types of people that are necessary for the reproduction of capitalist societies are not all reproduced by capitalists. So, for example, uh, the working class here and many other places was not produced by the United States, by the bourgeois of the United States necessarily. It was brought from the outside. And to do a good job in the factories, you're not going to get the people who are born and grew up and trained in New York City necessarily, in the immigrants. Or the immigrants de facto from the Mississippi Delta or you know, rural, rural pre-capitalist America, because they have different values. If everyone has the bourgeois value of self-interest and utility, things fall apart. Things fall apart. So the good worker in the factory is from the villages of outside Calabria or in Sicily or in Poland, because they, they have some honor. They have a different sense, you know, some the idea that, well, you have to have pride in your work, you know, much more, of course, than utilitarian and bourgeois subjects. And there's a limit to that as well, obviously, because at some point you run out of the pre-capitalist types to bring in to keep the system running. So now they say other things like if, uh, if the teachers want more money, or the workers in Greece demand better pensions, is seen as being, why should they have these nice pensions when it's the other side but it's investors making decisions about how to maximize profits, completely understandable. So the same, the same way of thinking that self-interested <laughs> on the bottom becomes, and always has been, of course, dysfunctional from the standpoint of capitalism, when it's at the top, it's complete. I mean, that's human nature. Of course, the investors want to maximize profits and minimize risks and so forth. So, that's one thing we should add, I think, to the adversarial problematic or reproduction, that there, there's a certain, there are certain external preconditions that have been, I mean, things may be changed, could change, but have been necessary for the reproduction of capitalist societies, in terms of the environment and nature, and in terms of the kinds of, the types of human beings needed to run the system. <clears throat> Another set of questions has to do with the question of struggle. And if it is the case that class struggle, political struggle, are fundamental to the reproducibility of the system, 
if you didn't have, for example, as in Poliani, the struggles from below, capitalism could have failed in a sense. They could have destroyed the conditions under which, which is of course the argument today of people like Pickett and the others, not about the struggle, but about the, the, the unreproducibility of the system. That when you have an increasing accumulation of wealth at the top, and such, the degrees of inequality become such that it becomes at, one, at some point unreproducible. So the lack of struggle from the law in the 1980s and 90s and today, I think, is not unfair to say. The lack of political struggles from below, together with changes in the capacities of the machinery of the state to mediate such struggles. And this is a man you by Nicholas Pulanzas in his, his last book, the way he deals in terms of authoritarian statements. That the state, and it has to do, of course, with somewhat Bruno said with the law and violence, that the state increasingly, because of the way the class struggle is materialized in state institutions, becomes so centralized, political party, so centralized, so bureaucratic and inflexible on the one hand. And on the other hand, we don't have the pressures from below. Why should the capitalist club make concessions? They're not stupid. They're not crazy. Why should they make concessions without struggles from below and demands? That increasingly then the state becomes incapable <coughs> of securing the consent of those below in the old way of there are some kind of modifications or reforms or give people Medicare or give them social security or give them free public schooling, free higher education. And you know maybe things will become more reproducible. And they can the state can only now react through coercion or as a tendency at least. I mean not that there's no longer any kind of social policies or welfare, welfare state-like dimensions to what goes on. But increasingly, I think it's clear to all of us more and more that repression is the way that any chance from below are, are, are dealt with. And here I think we have to come back to El Busser and this problematic. And in the context then of arguments such as those by Piketty and many others, pose the question again. Is the state, is the political moment of contemporary capitalist societies working through these ideological repressive apparatuses capable of, of securing extended production society? And it may be, but I'm not sure. I think now, as opposed to 20 or 25 years ago, it's much, much more now. And this, I think, is one reason, I mean, it's an unusually good timing that the book comes out now, because the old questions we were dealing with, but now we have a reintroduction of the importance of some of these arguments because we can no longer assume the reproducibility of the system. up with some of the very nice overlap between all of these talks. Uh, and it's good that they're short. And you're good that they're short. That's exactly. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here from the Berkeley del Beyond from the UK, where I, I live in Manchester. So happy to be here once again, another year. And uh, happy to talk about Althusser. Althusser is this panel with you. I, what I would like to do is to share with you some exploratory ideas. You know. We learn now, we knew it, but we learn in, in the new publication that in reality Althusser put together two very heterogeneous parts, which were the part best known in English of his work. And now in the new edition, we found some of the bridges between these two parts that Bruno was referring to, the question of the law, but also the question of, of revolution. And in the preface, Calibar refers to the dotted lines, dotted points, that very often appear in the manuscripts. And this links very nicely with the idea of the void, which is so important, particularly in the uh, lateral tutor, in the last uh, part of this work. What I would like to do here is somehow try to trace some lines connecting these 
voids, these points, these empty points, um, uh, with a view to try to solve the amazing continuity and consistency of, uh, of Althusser's work, despite the amazing breaks and the amazing changes that uh, he, he, he underwent through, uh, uh, through his life. So let me uh, answer. So the idea is to try to do something that is not very often done, and uh, is, all this is exploratory. So I would like to share it with you. Um, the idea is to, to try to solve the continuity and the consistency, amazing at various levels, of Althusser's work and of his quest for knowledge and for politics, for political struggle. Let me start with a brief story from Madrid, where I studied my, I did my undergraduate studies. We are in the early 80s, and um, in a contest of smart intellectuals in Madrid, in those times, in a moment in Spain in which there was a moment of hope, a little bit of joy. We know now what the so-called transition was about. There was no, no, the Francoists are there, but let's forget for a moment. Those times were times of hope, times of a bit of joy. I saw it in Madrid, the so-called La Movida. So we are in the context of intellectuals, academics, most of them, not all, but most smart intellectuals, no reactionary intellectuals, but no revolutionary intellectuals either. Mm -hmm. And they were laughing about Althusser all the time, all quite often. You know, this guy, Althusser, this idea that, you know, philosophy is class struggle in theory. <laughs> <laughs> How can this be so? Philosophy, we all know this, pure knowledge, contemplation. <laughs> Knowledge is not production. Knowledge is, in the best of the cases, observation or empirical or contemplation like philosophy. So what is the, the question here is, and the question that I, I don't think I was able to articulate, but I was wondering anyway at that time, that I would have asked them if I had had the intellectual or conceptual capacity to pose it is, what is the side from which you guys are speaking? Because Althusser is speaking from a very clear side, which is a side which is defined, I think, by a major principle which cuts across the whole of Althusser's work, which is the primacy of struggle and conflict over, for example, the contending parties. And this is fundamental, obviously, for the understanding of social class, social classes. So the primacy of conflict and struggle, I mean, this. Althusser joins uh, a very small group, a very tiny group of thinkers, of philosophers, the first of whom was Machiavelli, on whom Althusser wrote a very beautiful and very good book. So Althusser joins this very tiny group of thinkers who gave priority in their thought and in their praxis, we should say, to conflict and struggle over the contending parties, over the contending subjects, as you know, to sir, uh, disqualifies the idea of the subject as a constituting subject. He considered as a bourgeois creation, and his an anti-humanism is very much related to that. The subject that he theorizes is the constituted subject, which is the individual interpolated by, 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 by ideology as a subject. So I would have last, I, I, I would have liked to, to, to ask these intellectuals in Madrid, so what is the side you are talking about? Because Althusser's side is quite clear. I doubt that they would have been able to formulate it, but what is, is clear to me is that these intellectuals, and this is a major thing in, among academics and intellectuals, they are, what I call court intellectuals, or court humanists, or court writers, so humanist intellectuals of court, or the powers that be, that they might provide a little bit of a critique of the powers that be, but nevertheless, they feel fully at home within the system. 
and you know they if we go a little bit to classical philosophy they used to call it gentlemen but in reality we know that uh, there is only one name for those powers which is the oligarchy because I mentioned Machiavelli before and uh, Machiavelli among other things uh, so that all aristocracies you know what the name means you know, rule the best uh, are nothing but oligarchies kleptocracies and plutocracies so rule of money, rule of things um, so Althusser's side <coughs> it was clear and I think that in relation to this side which is underpinned as I say by this principle of the priority of, of conflict, the priority of, of the struggle, we find a major line of continuity now, you might wonder now, but Althusser provided many definitions, or at least two fundamental ones, but in reality several definitions of philosophy. Um, one of them being philosophy, uh, class struggle in theory, but uh, the theory of theoretical practice, uh, yes. So, but it's always, in my view, always around this positioning, this side, which was not always well defined because part of his thought and part of his practice consisted in trying to define it and trying to act accordingly. So all these definitions of philosophy that have been normally and are highlighted as major shifts in Althusser's work, in reality there is something underpinning this which is quite, let's say, which consistent. It's quite consistent. Yeah. Here, uh, in relation to, to this, we could refer both to well, to two major critiques that Althusser has been uh, that have been addressed to Althusser, uh, the theoreticism, but also the opposite, practicism, trying to uh, undermine, even destroy the opposition between theory and practice, and trying to create or to develop a practice in which theory and theorizing is is just a practice, as any other. <coughs> So I think this is a major line of, of, of continuity in Althusser's work. And uh, um, as I said before, in this, he's part of a very small, very tiny group of thinkers, of philosophers, thinkers, uh, political thinkers, who have opposed most of the, tra the tradition in placing themselves, we have to say it in Machiavellian, on the side of the people on the side of the multitude, on the side of, of, on the, side of the proletariat. Now, if, if we continue with this idea of trying to find the lines of continuity and consistency, and we refer to the problematic of reproduction, then here, perhaps, here we have to shift a little bit into perspective as well, because Normally we think that the Althusser of what has been published in English as the philosophy of the encounter, this is just the last Althusser, the last part of this book. But in reality, from the very beginning, there are fundamental elements and concepts of this aleatory materialism there. And this is very relevant for understanding uh, the question of and the problematic of reproduction. And it links what, what Peter just mentioned, why this is a very timely moment for publishing the complete uh, manuscript now, and how uh, how now the question has become, but is capitalism going to be able to reproduce itself now, taking into account these limits, for example, nature, and even other limits. Uh, so here, perhaps we have to see the perspective, and uh, just as before we had the principle of primacy of a struggle here, we got another kind of principle, which is that uh, conflict, change, contingency, that's in principle. This in principle is not a problem to be, uh, the problem is order, in the sense that how on earth does order and therefore the reproduction of a given social formation happens because order in this broad sense encompassing whether model production or social formation is a fact or something to be accomplished. It's not an accomplished fact. 
So it's something that has to be struggled for and has to be done. So reproduction from this point of, of, of view means that reproduction is always the transformation of what was at least initially contingent into something which has become or is made to become necessary. So reproduction is the becoming necessary of what was initially <coughs> contingent. And from this point of view, if we link it with primary accumulation or primitive accumulation as it has been translated in, in Mars's test, to which Althusser refers in a few occasions, and here there have been some critiques by Christine to mention one, one of them. If we link it to, to primary, primitive, original accumulation, then we find here uh, quite another interesting line of, in this case, of, of inquiry, because um, well, you know that at the core of primary accumulation is this astonishing violence produced by the organized society, as Marx says in the Capital Volume One. So by the state, but there in Marx there are like two ideas, two different ideas of reproduction. And one of them, well, I would say there are three, but I just want to mention just one, and I finish with this. One of them is the, the one which has to do with the famous um, nursery tale. I'm going to quote for you what Marx says. And uh, this is something I, I do um, with my students as well, because I think it's very uh, powerful, and it shows the point of Althusser's idea of of the interpolated individual, which becomes a subject by being interpolated. I'm going to quote Marx. So we are talking about the famous nursery tale. Huh? And afterwards, after quoting Marx, I will quote for you some selected quotes, brief, from John Locke, the father of liberalism, the father of, yeah, uh, liberalism, neoliberalism is all the same. I, I do not distinguish between liberalism and neoliberalism. I know that in America, liberalism has a different context. Anyway, this is the quote. The primitive accumulation plays in political, this primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same role as original sin in theology. Adam beat the apple, and thereupon sin fell on the human race. Its origin is supposed to be explained when it is told as an anecdote of the past. <coughs> In times long gone, long gone by, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite. The other, the lazy one, spending their substance and more in riotous living. The legend of theological original sin tells us certainly how man came to be condemned to eat his breath in the sweat of his brow. Thus, it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth, and the latter sort had at last nothing to sell except their own schemes. And from this original scene dates the poverty of the great majority that despite all his labor, has up to now nothing to sell but itself, and the wealth of the few that increases constantly although they have long ceased to work, end quote. Now, I'm going to quote from John Locke, because this is a parable, and say, to see how perfect the match is between these two ideas. Mars explaining the nursery tale that we are told that in reality capitalism emerged, you know, because they were the elite who were, you know, laborious and frugal and, uh, and, and intelligent, of course. In a book which is very neglected by John Locke, which is called The Reasonableness of Christianity, it goes without saying that much more important than the letter on toleration and all this bullshit, he says, the people, I'm quoting, cannot know, therefore they must believe. And the whole book, The Reasonableness of Christianity, is a doctrine of how to transform Christianity into simple commands so that people can obey their masters. Um, 
I am talking the language that blocks uses in this book. Neglected. Another couple of quotes, and uh, I finish with a comment. Well, even in a book like they say concerning human understanding, supposedly about epistemology and about political, he distinguishes there in a very clear cut manner between the industrious and rational, who are a minority, he says, and the lazy and inconsiderate, who are the greatest part. And in this same book, an essay concerning human understanding, he says, look at this. Huh? There is a greater distance between some men and others than between men, so humanity in reality means, and some beasts. So the distance between the elite and the people is greater than the distance between humanity and the beasts. If we compare the understanding and abilities of some men and some brutes, we shall find so little difference. This is from say concerning human understanding. So you can see Mars nursery tale how has flexed and has a fundamental ideological component, which is still effective. To conclude, I guess that we could continue Althusser's work on ideology and linking uh, it with the Lacanian unconscious, which after all is one of the lines of investigation that some people are trying to follow by focusing upon this nursery tale and seeing how the subject, <coughs> so the individual who had already been interpreted as a, as a subject or became a subject as a consequence of being interpreted, here works in relation to the other. The other and the others decide. And you can question the middle classes in the broader sense and academics as to whether they do not follow unconsciously this idea that in reality, as compared with the people who don't have anything, they have it because, or we have it, because we deserve it. The question of the other and the question of the unconscious and the structure, I think it has a lot of interest, but it's at the core, in my view, of reproduction, even at this apparently simplistic level of making this distinction, which liberalism has worked a lot on it and continues to work between the few, the elite, so the oligarchy, and the, and the many. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll open up the floor to uh, questions. One thing we did not uh, really put up on the board that Carlos alludes to is the famous um, proposition of um, of Lacan, that the unconscious is structured like a language, right? And the structure of language is very, very important to Althusser. We do not really talk about that in yes. terms of processes of articulation. And one thing that we could, you know, maybe discuss with Bruno and Kristen to a degree is this anti-humanist turn was also based on, you know, the, the determinacy of language, also scientific inquiry. So, one thing I can add. So, I'll open up the floor unless any comments from any of you or on each other. No? We want to, you know, try to make this into more. Yes? I'm wondering if the, the concept of ideological state apparatus is not fundamentally problematic in the sense that in Althusser's formulation, uh, we are invited to believe that family all sorts of voluntary organizations of civil society, uh, the church. These are all somehow to be seen as, as apparatuses of the state. Um, I just find that notion problematic in terms of how we can arrive at that kind of conclusion. I'm wondering whether Althusser is not rather uncritically processing some of Gramsci's notion of hegemonia in terms of developing that idea, but it doesn't seem to me that it's ever been critically established in the context of his writing on that. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on Peter, that. Peter, since you're a uh, president yeah, state I mean, theorist, uh, though. <clears throat> you have two possibilities. Either you believe there is an inside and outside to the state, or you don't. So if you believe that what happens in the family, what happens in the labor, you have the workforce, 
is completely separate from the question of the political of the state, then you may be right. Alpha Circuit disagrees, as does Gramsci, as does Lee. And if you look at the question from the standpoint of extended reproduction to begin with, or even the standpoint of law, Alpha Circuit makes a point where he says, and the safety of private and public and private is not the distinction of what is inside and outside the state. It is a distinction of what kind of law applies to where. We're talking about civil law, criminal law, public law. It is a, a, a distinction internal to the, law, the legal logic of the state, certainly, and for sure the political logic and reality of the society. So if indeed it is the case, and he changed his argument in this essay, he says the school is the most important essay. In his autobiography, then, he says, I made the mistake, it's the family. Because then he was writing about his family, of course, and his parents. Well. So the family is the There was some subjectivity in that. Yeah, we that's a debatable yeah, right. uh, which one is the most yeah. fundamental. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah uh, the, the, the family was uh, repressive as well as, of course, right. So if you look to the question of how the society is able to reproduce itself, what are the, the, the kinds of struggles, the kinds of activities through which, yes, things happen? And you look at the level of, of what is the, I mean, what is the level of ideology? The level of ideology. If you read out certain definition of ideology in this essay, it is almost word for word the same as Marx and Engels in the German ideology. One big difference, the individual. It is no longer an imagined representation of the ripple of and natural representation of the individual to their real conditions of existence. Which is to say, ideology is always lived. Ideology, by definition, is lived experience. That's why I'm saying there's no beginning and end of ideology. There's no society outside of ideology. Because always we have the mediation of the body and of the senses. Like in Plato's cave, yes, with the screen. And the, always you have that. So ideology is universal. This or that ideology is particular. And from on the level of, of of institutions and practices, the ritualization and repetition of certain practices is, of course, the key, the key question. And here he follows Pascal in what is, of course, one of the most important texts on the question of ideology, the wager, why people should believe in religion. Right? And if you know, I mean, Pascal asked the question, well, should we believe in a God or not? And he has the thing, well, if you don't believe in the God, and there's a God, you get eternity in hell. If you know you don't believe it, and there's no God, what do you gain? You know, some sex, some meat on you know, Fridays and that kind of thing, some sleep on Sundays. And if you do believe there's a God and there's a God, you get eternity. So the smart money is on to believe. Because if you win, you win big. If you lose, I mean, you didn't lose all that much. So the smart money is on the belief, but the problem is how to believe, knowing what we know. Knowing, Pascal was not stupid. Knowing philosophy, knowing mathematics, how you believe in all of these fairy tales of the serpent, you know, the serpent with the sword. How do you believe all these stupid things? Pascal says, don't worry about it. Just pretend. <laughs> Act as if you believe in the automation of the body, he says, will lead the mind. This is what ideology is enough, right? The all, you can, Believe anything, you know, the head, what holds on the head is irrelevant. The, first of all, the, the argument is that belief is the level of, of practice, not in the head. The head follows because when you have the moment of interpolation, you become conscious, he says, of what you already believe. So the family, of course, is fundamental. How can you talk about lived experience and identity and repetition and ritual without bringing questions of the family, without bringing the questions of, of course, the school. And whether it's a public school or private school, in that formal sense, it's irrelevant. That's not, it's an irrelevant question because it's the functional position of school and of those sets of practices that, that is the key. So we cannot get hung up on the legalisms of what the state itself presents as being inside or outside certain kinds of domains in reality course, the state is ubiquitous, in that it is a part of, the logic is operant on all the levels. The families, the labor unions, the media, the schools, whether it's the BBC or it's NBC, is a tertiary or, or worse kind of a, a distinction. Uh, Manuel? Yeah. Um, 
I think what you just said um, kind of resonates with something you were um, referring to before in this relation between uh, Polanyi and, and Althusser and, and the fact that in the Great Transformation, um, my, well, my memory of it uh, is, is pretty much that there are all these uh, elements, as you very well explained, that are not capitalistic but are very instrumental to the preservation of capitalism and there are those that have to be regulated. In the, in the in the capitalist preservation and, and renovation of itself. Um, and uh, what you were saying made me think that um, the, the magic of capitalism can be actually the fact that this um, um, hybridity is always taken advantage of. In the sense that, you know, if we don't, if we cannot speak about a, a world outside of ideology, outside of capitalism, etc. Um, you are obliged to think that when you were saying, well, they take the Polish or the Calabrian uh, workers because they have these values, you have to think about subjectivity as, a, as, a, as an incredible amount of strata, wherein some strata are non-capitalistic but can be you know, instrumental in the, in the ingraining of capitalism. So in, among these strata, um, those that are non-capitalistic are instrumental to capitalism. And when you think about struggle and organized struggle and revolution, you, you have to think about the same strata, only, only under a different music, which is basically those strata. Some of them are instrumental for the revolutionary uh, goals. Some of them actually are impeaching, are, are preventing the, the revolutionary goals to be. So, so, so the funny thing is that in, in capitalism, all these things are actually being uh, uh, instrumentalized, and they help the, the engine. Whereas in the revolutionary, actually those parts that are, that are non-revolutionary can actually I mean, actually, do block the engine all the time, and this makes me think. Uh, makes me jump to the question of humanism, which is the, the question I, I wanted to initially ask, um, because I think it sort of went through some of the of your presentations, which is basically uh, I, the way I understand Bruno's claim and, and the way it was uh, taken by, by by others afterwards is, well, certainly we cannot think about the human. Uh, in terms of humanism, because humanism implies an essentialism. Implies that the human is something that somehow will be preserved um, and will guide the revolution. So therefore, if we think about the, about the human itself as an ideological construct, then after the revolution, well, it, it, will, it will not be human. It will, it will be something else. We cannot think in humanistic terms, right? Uh, I, I don't know if you would say it that way, or you would, I mean, and this is my, one of my, my questions. And second question would be like, if you think that what would happen after the revolution with a different subjectivity or something like that will be still human, or inevitably human, and that's the humanism you're referring to. And then the third, the third part of the question, and, and I'm sorry that this is getting so, so uh, arborescent, um, is that uh, the way I think about humanism and the need of humanism today, for instance, actually has to do with very uh, basic uh, existentialistic questions that, that bring back to Camus and the question of suicide. I think today, uh, you know, revolution implies, you know, uh, in, in, in a way the thought of suicide for many people and you, have to, you only have to look at the, at the Arabian Spring uh, to see the amount of, uh, or the film that, that recently they told Michael about the, 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 the transpersonage, uh, the, what's the name in, in English, the, 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 the snow piercer, this, uh, this, this fable, uh, again about revolution. So, you know, that's the way the humanism can help today. Okay, let's, let's, let's recuperate a theory of, 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 of suicide, an idea of death, an eschatology, something that can lead a revolution beyond the idea of self-interest. That would be a provocation, I would end with uh, my question. Bruno, you want to respond to the humanism? Yeah, the question I, yeah. of humanism, I mean, I, I will say just a few things because there is so much to say. You know, but... Uh, sorry, I apologize. Sorry. No, 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 but I say no, I mean, it's a very long, it would be a very long, very interesting conversation, but, but I think that uh, I start from the, the, the question, the fear of uh, essentialism, right, which is always there, uh, you know, but the, and I would distinguish between two concepts: uh, human nature and the human condition. 
Now, human nature leads us directly into essentialism, meaning this human nature is already pre-established, uh, fixed, and so on and so forth, and this is, of course, uh, untrue. This is false. Uh, but the human condition, no one can deny. I mean, that there is a human condition, also that the difference between the human animal, what I like to say, and the non-human animals, the beasts. I mean, it is there, for better or for worse. I'm not saying, I'm not looking at this in the higher, uh, hierarchical way, but it is uh, a condition in which uh, you know humanity finds itself for whatever reason, but it, it is not the nature. So, but uh, because there would be too much, uh, so much to say, I, I, I link now to the question about interpolation that everybody spoke about and the making of the subject that I personally did not touch upon when I uh, spoke. Uh, but the question is that uh, the subject itself is a very pro problematic uh, notion and it is uh, ambiguous, right? When we say the subject, I mean, what Althusser really means is uh, that by interpolation, one, is, one becomes a subject in the sense that one is, is subject later. Right, but the subject is not necessarily not only that. I mean, subject subjectum is like from the Latin, it's that which is thrown under as the ground. And uh, if I pronounce the, the rightly in uh, Greek, it's eupokaimenon, which is the same idea, right? So the, the question is uh, this ground, which is problematic, uh, if we look at that in Cartesian terms, for example, although I, I think that there is so much that is important in what Descartes does with the uh, the subject, but what I mean to say is that the subject is also the revolutionary subject, not the one that is subject, it's not the one that after self becomes, for example, the also body of, uh, in Foucault, the obedient body and so on, but the rebellious one, right? That's also a subject, the revolutionary subject. So, I, I, and I think that in this sense, humanism must be recuperated as a, uh, because otherwise it would be like history without subject, just the structure and then no agency, as Christian uh, were also at one point uh, saying, right? And, and that would be as problematic. Also, uh, actually one thing that Christian you said, uh, that uh, uh, Althusser, right, says that things are already there for people, uh, waiting for people, right? So this can be understood from uh, an Althusserian point of view, but uh, you know, uh, when, I, when you were speaking, I thought, but this is what Sartre also says, in a completely different way. I mean, that, that there is a predestiny, so to speak, that, that there is a social destiny waiting for us, right? I mean, like, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever, even stupid things like, uh, you know, in the family, children of, uh, uh, in a family in which everybody has been always uh, a lawyer or a physician, people become a lawyer, a lawyer's physicians, and so on. This uh, destiny that is waiting there, for us, it's the same idea. And so when I say, for start, uh, from the other point of view, the humanist point of view, and uh, this links to the Camus that you mentioned, of course, the existentialism uh, too. So I, I think that uh, it is in this sense that uh, um, the, the idea, the concept, uh, the reality of a, a different revolutionary, radically different, I mean, the humanism, the Marx says, you know, we have to go back the radix, uh, the roots, and uh, for men, the roots is a man himself. Uh, this cannot be, uh, you know, abandoned, because otherwise, you know, I think that we abandon too much. I mean, uh, you know, I just say a few words. And, uh, yeah, so gentlemen back there, I'm sorry we have to kind of move on. But well, I, I, I know they're very you know, rigorous <clears throat> questions here. We could go on for days. So, 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 uh, Althusser does not just live in the academy. He participates in the resistance. Yes. He adheres consistently to membership in the Communist Party. He's presumably out there as a militant, selling its newspaper on a regular basis. And even though he sat out '68, his students certainly didn't. There was a a, 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 an integration between theory and practice that leads to the positions that he takes in this theoretical realm. The discussion here today tends to be very academic in the sense of there are these texts, we're talking about their meaning and their elaboration. How then, or is there anything in these texts, those that are newly available or being elaborated on within the academy, that can help people break out of the walls of the academy and find ways to make a difference in terms of political interventions today. I'm in, I'm in agreement with you that he was always of the practical in the, in the beginning. The theory came afterwards. The practical theoretical activity was based on experience that he had 
both within the party, in the Reading Capital Group, as you know, selling of newspaper, interventions often, which were both against the party, to sharpen the party, and also to speak to, you know, a whole generation of students. And there are many centers that were formed around Althusser too, that were not especially academic as we call academic. The Reading Capital Group was certainly not academic. These were all practic, you know, people that were very involved in, in the situation and in the events of May of 68. So, you know, just to put it into a context. Do you want to, you want to uh, try to talk uh, to this? Well, no, a, I mean, I you know, agree with that. The agency, that, you know, yeah. the question of agency. I mean, it's a very, um, you know, it's where this sort of Leninism comes in, that the idea that the truth of science has everything to do with uh, revolutionary theory and the activity of the party together, that they're not, for him, they're not separable, I think. I think that's true. Okay. Anybody else? I don't, there's a first of all, academia has never been a fertile venue for radicalism or social change, and it continues in that tradition. There are fringes, you know, of some people who are, as my friend Stanley says, in the academy, not of the academy, of which I think many of the people of this conference fall under under that category. Right? But I don't have no hope for academics. <laughs> Forget the school. Yeah, yeah, of course. There's no, there's no possibility for that. The discussion of the texts can be scholastic or can be more political. I think today we didn't really have a scholastic discussion in that it is narrowly focused on the text, and you know it's always with an eye towards how how we can appropriate the ideas to explain the current situation, what it helps something about the current moment. And understanding is fundamental. I think we cannot discount how important and how little we understand, you know, about what, what goes on around us. You know, things are changing with such incredible speed and such fundamental ways that in many ways we're, you know, all of us have been busy trying to figure out what's going on. So I think that in and of itself is the most fundamental. And of course, always we have an eye towards, we have some idea of what we like or don't like, where we would like to go. But just to understand what's going on is immensely uh, complex and difficult. And this is really a struggle in itself. I'd just like to add that, you know, during the 1970s and 80s, there was a tremendous antipathy in the United States to Althusser. Daddy Dodd took the high ground of, you know, uh, not Althusser. Althusser was left out of many, many uh, uh, literary uh, uh, criticism books, many, many classes. The symptomatic reading was maybe referred to in passing, but was never front and center. It was the deconstructive moment and the postmodernist moment, not the Althusserian. So he never really was absorbed into the American Academy, you know, as, as Derrida, Lyotard, and others uh, were. So I think this is important to remember here in the States. Much more accepted in England. There were groups in England that, that took them off. But, you know, yeah. So Stanley, and then, yeah. yeah. I just, just as a comment, yeah. in England, what they did in England was uh, to accept the idea of theoretical practice without any real cr cr criticism. Right. But that's not my right. question. Um, I, th this is a question about, about, um, about, about Althusser's relationship to the dialectic. When, uh, Bruno, when you described the law, um, you described the relationship between repressive apparatus and ideological apparatus in spatial terms, which would seem to be a very Althusserian notion on the one hand. On the other hand, it may be the case, and I wonder whether this is uh, your view, I, I mean, this is just one example of the question, whether in fact there's a dialectic between the ideological function of the law as well and, and the repressive function, so that, that in different times and in different ways, the law functions in both ways, right? That is to say, it, it, it is both an ideological state <coughs> apparatus question. and it is a repressive apparatus, and this is what gives it such tremendous power and uh, if you see this in relationship to the labor movement, which I've just been writing about, um, the labor movement uh, gets scrunched by the law at the same time it, it has awe of the law. I use that word awe, A-W-E, of the law. And it, it, this, ha this, is this is simultaneous. So that the second part of that conversation, in my view, is, has to do with interpolation, which is if, 
if, if, if we are always already interpolated ideologically, the question becomes, um, and maybe this is for, for Peter particularly, specifically, what is the character of politics? Politics always implies a subject which at some point must have, it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, must have a relatively, relative independence of that interpolation. So the interpolation always has to be at best partial, right? It cannot be, we are always already interpolated by, by ideology and therefore our lived experience is always you know, dealing with some form of a fairy tale or fantasy or whatever. Because at some point we have science and we have, we have uh, whether the science is in the form of the party, certainly not the French party. But anyway, uh, we have science, but at the same time we have, pra we have, a, we have a, a, a practice. So what I'm asking is, what I'm asking is, does Althusser, despite himself, have a dialectical view that can be very fruitful because he actually understands the two-sidedness within the same frame form. Uh, he understands the two-sidedness of all categories rather than simply a one-sided structural perspective. Yeah, and so I, uh, I'm a Yes, I mean, I, I'd like to say that absolutely, I think so. I mean, in terms of the dialectics that you slightly say that uh, that is there, it's certainly now to say. And uh, I think that the question arises precisely because of this uh, imbalance, perhaps, in the dialectics, uh, in the dialectic itself, that uh, is, uh, um, you know, uh, showing today, in, in the sense that uh, the question is why so much, I mean, if there is more repression today, I mean, uh, and uh, what is the place of the law? Uh, so I was thinking of, uh, as you were asking the question, about what Foucault says, I believe in uh, uh, society must be defended, uh, that uh, at one point he says that instead of uh, using uh, dialectics, uh, uh, logic, uh, dialectic uh, logic, he will use a logical strategy and uh, to describe some things. When, no, no, but I, I mean, what, what I mean to say is that the question is why, uh, you know, what is the, the place of the, the repressive state apparatus that uh, maybe is no longer in that type of relationship with the ideological state apparatus, apparatus is, uh, as it was before. Uh, you don't think, no, but I, well, one thing that I want to say also to go back to something that Peter was uh, speaking about before, the question of uh, the reproduction the possibility the capital has to reproduce itself, whether there is still this capacity. So uh, maybe the question is uh, that today uh, people are certainly, uh, and the subjects are not simply subjected, that uh, maybe interpolation doesn't work the way perhaps uh, uh, it should work, it worked before. There is a democratization with all the problems because also of uh, the information age, uh, because of uh, uh, the internet. I mean, uh, people know more, people can know more than they did before. I mean, I'm not saying at some levels at least, uh, things like uh, the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement, the Arab Spring, and so on, with all the limitations, with all the problems, are a sign of something going on that uh, constituted power is no longer able to handle the way they did before, probably. It is here that there is a rupture in the dialectical relationship, yes, between the repressive uh, and the ideological state apparatus, but there is uh, something that doesn't work as smoothly uh, as before, and so perhaps there is this uh, dominance. I have a follow-up, uh, Bruno. Is it possible that Hegel crept back in? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that notwithstanding what all of the acolytes thought, how he left Hegel behind, right. he never quite liberated himself from Hegel because you can actually understand the, the dual functions uh, of, of, of all of the categories, including education, by the way, including communication, the media as well, as really a dialectical relationship between those aspects which are entirely regressive and those aspects which have <coughs> at least the possibility of a progressive move forward. I'm mean, just wondering. Yeah. And then Althusser indicates that, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I think you wanted to also... No, I mean, the, the question of Althusser is the subject with the small s or a capital S. Yeah. Right. It's your relations about the small s, right? Why 
under what conditions individuals recognize themselves as X, Y, or Z. Under what conditions, if I say, you know, my, and my fellow New Yorkers, does someone recognize themselves as the address C of, 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 of that address? Yes? That's interpolation. With the capital S, which is, which is, is a different thing. And the capital S is the subject of, of class struggle, or of course, uh, or, or the subject of, let's say, or is a subject that, that of, of political autonomy that uh, shapes, of course, uh, history or, 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 or things more broadly. One precondition for that, from the standpoint of us, breaking with lived experience subjectivity is then fearing the, the capital T, having the capacity to see things beyond the lived, which is not, ex I mean, it's not Althusserian, it's rationalism, it's Durkheim, it's Plato, you know, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's many, many things. It's Gramsci on education. It education. It's Gramsci on education as well, That's yes. Right. I mean, it, it's, not, it, it's not particularly Althusserian in that insight, but it's important to, in the context of arguing on the material of ideology, to, you know, bring in, of course, the, uh, the distinction. Yeah. Uh, this gentleman here. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if you can say something about Balibar, because this is obviously coming to us through Balibar. And, uh, um, well, actually, Francois, not that long. Well, right, I mean, primarily. you, you know the history of that, but the, there is in the panel, there is in the new volume, there's a little bit of a retreat, there's a little bit of a return. Uh, let me give you one anecdote about Balibar. I took a course with him in, in London uh, last summer, and uh, he mentions that he mentioned one anecdote when he was in some kind of conference and people were asking issues about the world and about post-colonialism. He said, "I found myself becoming Hegelian." Well, I think what that anecdote tells us, because also Balibar returns to Althusser. I don't think he ever left, and he remains very French in a certain French way. And here we are looking at some. A specific moment in the 70s, and as, uh, again, Balibar also returning to 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 Althusser. The, the, um, there will be value in the return and the retreat. I'm not saying, but there's something profoundly insufficient about a certain critical intelligence of an old Marxist only looking at his own French tradition. He has nothing to say I've, even after having been in the U.S. In London, he didn't look at the world, really. He looked at the own, I don't want to trivialize his, bio, his biography, and this is a, I admire these guys. Uh, but there's something profoundly insufficient about someone who, after having been to the US, having traveled abroad, having been to many places, remains very much where he started. There's no growth into anything. There's a very much, very Eurocentric, French-centered, French language dominated, critical intelligence of a certain Marxism that doesn't look at the world, doesn't engage intellectually with the world, um, that has its place, I repeat. You know, Althusser has, I think, I think one, of the, one of the presenters said it. It may, we, it may give us tools to, for diagnosis and critical intelligence for our own moment, looking back at the 70s. But I'm just wondering if, you know, Balibar, that, Great guy, but that's a really old Marxist of a certain type. He doesn't give me USA. He gives me French. Uh, he even a return to Hegel is very symptomatic. It's not Sisekian and return to Hegel. It's not, it's like, don't bring me, you know, don't bring me Africans talking about what they do in Africa. Let me retreat with Bali in my, I mean, without to share in my own room. So he's like, okay, I mean, look, look, yes. Yes, and there's something a little funny there. So I don't know if you share that. I don't know if you share that. It's interesting that you say that because I, I found myself, as I was reading this, and as I was kind of getting together in these remarks, just thinking that at a certain point I had to get out of this idea that every thought is either French or German. Well, absolutely, you know? absolutely, like, I, I, absolutely. I, I, well, for Heidegger, it's like, only German. The French <laughs> don't begin to think until they think And I do German. not want, I, again, I do not wish to trivial, I do not wish to trivialize. You understand, it's a sympathetic question. Balibar has a thick French accent. He remains very French. And in London, he's like, what is this guy doing? He doesn't, 
you know, he but goes back. But, but, no, no, but, but even but in his questions, in his questions, in his, no, no, no. But, 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 but I mean that. But but I mean that. As a, but but, as a, but I, I, I truly mean that. Symptomatic of something else. Because you could see him retreating when, when people, in London it was an international audience. People were asking, what about this? What about that? What about, he, he, would, he would, you could almost see him retreating think, to I his French I room. To, I think I want to challenge you a bit. Okay, okay. You know, okay. Balibar has been absolutely fundamental for the theoretical development of something that now is called method, borderless method, for example. He has being engaged with the question of the sans papier of the immigrants okay. so and the, for ages, for ages, years. and I find quite unfair. You, okay, I, okay, okay. I understand, but I find quite okay. unfair. And on the other hand, to talk and address post-colonial stuff is to do it in principle by academics from the Western world. It doesn't mean to be in Africa, to be, you know, it depends how it is addressed, how it is posted, yeah. you know. And with all fairness, so, he did write a book on Spinoza, the, the, two books, as well as John Locke. He has gone outside of just writing on modes of production. He collaborated, he collaborated with Wallerstein, but he did not he pursue did that line of thought. Yes. No, no, he no, didn't again. pursue that. No, it's no, a respectful... That was fortunate for yeah. no, yeah, some yeah. people on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you didn't mention in your presentation uh, the role of Spinoza, right, in developing this idea of logics and apparatuses, right, and basically the idea of materiality of ideology goes back to Spinoza's problem and language. Spinoza is, of course, a key figure. I mean, I think the key precursor, I mean, you have precursors by way of Gaston Bachelard, who was Althusser's uh, 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 supervisor for his. Uh, PhD, which is, of course, a very important influence. But before Bachelard, obviously, there were precursors, and I think Spinoza and Pascal are the most important. Both of whom you mentioned in the, the text. Pascal, I mean, the, the example he gives of Neo Dami, the Lipson Berlin group, is Pascalian, of course, you know, a, a contribution. And uh, Spinoza is, of course, very fundamental to the project more broadly. That, as Michael mentioned, Balabar and others, but Balabar most of them are not Spinoza. Well, Machere, even. Machere, five volumes on Spinoza. Yeah, from, from that. Uh, but, but formal, formal. Yeah. Yes, sir. 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 Yeah. Yes,